This is VOA Africa. Hello, I'm Esther Gitu Yuat. It's Friday, July 31st. This is Africa 54. Due to the global outbreak of COVID-19, Voice of America is taking every necessary precaution to safeguard its employees. So our broadcast will look a little different today and in the near future, as we, out of an abundance of caution, reduce our staffing at VO headquarters here in Washington. We're working to help keep you informed about what's going on and we appreciate your staying with us on Africa 54. As COVID-19 rages across much of the United States, Dr. Anthony Fauci, the government's top infectious disease expert, is on Capitol Hill Friday testifying before the House Select Subcommittee on the Coronavirus Crisis. The House panel is divided about how to reopen schools and businesses, mirroring divisions among Americans. Nearly 4.5 million Americans have been infected by COVID-19 since the start of the pandemic, and more than 152,000 have died, according to Johns Hopkins University data. Now to Africa, where due to a sharp rise in coronavirus cases, Libya's internationally recognized government in Tripoli says it is imposing a full lockdown in areas of the country it controls. The main outbreaks are in Tripoli, Misrata, and Sebhar, according to Libya's National Center for Disease Control. The lockdown starts Friday and will last for at least five days, forbidding all movement outside except to buy necessities. Friday is also the first day of the Muslim festival of Eid al-Adha. According to Johns Hopkins University, Libya has over 3,400 infections and 73 deaths. As COVID-19 continues to spread globally in Africa, cases of the new coronavirus are projected to pass 1 million this week. That's according to Dr. Machidiso Moeti, the WHO's Regional Director for Africa. David Doyle of Reuters has more. Cases of the new coronavirus in Africa are expected to pass the 1 million mark over the next week, the World Health Organization has said with its regional director for the continent, Dr. Matsudiso Moeti, warning that the disease continues to accelerate in some countries. As this critical signpost approaches, governments, partners and communities must work together to suppress COVID-19 transmission and mitigate the impacts of this pandemic on individuals, families, households and economies. Moeti said there are now almost 890,000 reported infections and that around 18,000 people had lost their lives. She said confirmed cases have doubled in the past 25 days, but while South Africa continues to account for the majority, the rate of infection there has slowed. However, in over 20 African countries, including Ethiopia, Kenya and Madagascar, there were more new cases in the past seven days than in the previous week. We are seeing in Africa and other parts of the world that when measures to suppress COVID-19 transmission are eased, cases creep up. So Mwati reiterated what she called the urgent need for international solidarity with African countries, both in tackling COVID-19 and in addressing broader socio-economic consequences, saying no one is safe until we are all safe. That report by David Doyle of Reuters. Botswana's truck drivers who deliver the majority of landlocked countries' goods from COVID hit South Africa are also responsible for 80% of the country's reported coronavirus cases. Health authorities started testing all truckers for the virus in May, delaying them at the border for days at a time. Mkondisi Dube reports on their plight from Havarone. Trucker we see so Balati used to look forward to his daily drive from his home country, Botswana, to pick up goods in Ebarin, South Africa. But since the COVID-19 pandemic, border trips for truckers like him have become a nightmare of being tested and forced to wait up to five days for results. Balati says the conditions at the border check are awful, with no food vendors or proper toilets. <laughs> It is tough. There are times when we think of quitting. Where we go to in South Africa, there are high cases of coronavirus. What we are asking for is to be treated with dignity as we provide an essential service.
Officials in Botswana say with nearly half a million cases of the fast spreading virus in South Africa, testing people who cross the border is vital. After Botswana recorded a new daily record for confirmed cases, truckers, especially from South Africa, are being watched carefully. These are largely uh, border cases and 80% uh, of these 50 cases were non-citizen. Uh, so uh, it also tells a story where the threat level or the pressure of risk is, is, is based. It is at the border. Analyst Florence Okedita says the pandemic should be a wake-up call for Botswana's reliance on South African goods. This COVID thing has proven that the country is in a precarious position, uh, particularly when you look into its dependence on South Africa. The country needs to be at a point where it now can depend on itself for you know, a good number of vital supplies. You know, we import literally everything. Botswana's government figures show South Africa accounted for nearly three quarters of the country's import bill as of April this year. For the moment, nothing has changed and the truckers remain vulnerable to the coronavirus. Of Botswana's 739 COVID-19 cases, 620 have been truck drivers testing positive at the country's entry points. Mkondi Sidube for VOA News, Haboroni. The U.S. Congress is trying to agree on funding to prevent those who have lost jobs because of COVID-19 from also losing their homes. Government aid has helped many renters in Virginia, but some face eviction as both state and federal moratoriums expired. VOA's Veronica Balderas Iglesias has the story of one family at the brink of homelessness in Alexandria. Originally from Sudan, U.S. citizen Sami Burma used to earn $6,000 a month working three jobs back to back. Now, he has no job because of COVID-19. I'm behind for my rent for four months. You know, uh, all what we have right now is the unemployment money. Trying is like to have some, a little bit in the side for any emergency with the kids. I'm afraid to lose my house. The rent is very high. We have a new baby on the way and the children to maintain. Although Sami has been helped by a weekly unemployment check for $758, it's not enough to pay the rent at his apartment complex. Southern Towers did not qualify under the now expired National Eviction Moratorium. The protections that prevent evictions and late fees and other fees associated with late payment are not covered under the CARES Act. Bell Partners, the company that manages the property, says it's helping renters by waiving late fees and extending due dates. Still, after the Virginia moratorium expired in June, it filed a claim to evict Sam's family. In court, he showed proof he had been laid off. That bought him some time. There is a protection that was put in place recently in Virginia. So if, if you have fallen behind and lost income due to COVID, uh, so you were up to, to date on your rent before COVID hit, you can um, ask the court or request the court for a 60 extra days. Under pressure, local authorities are rushing to help households like Sammy's. It is much less expensive and less tragic for a family to remain in their home and not be evicted than it is for us to relocate them. Cancel rent! The national eviction threat is dire. An estimated 28 million renters and 16 million homeowners are at risk says the real estate investment firm Amherst Capital. In Virginia, more than one million households face housing insecurity, says Democratic Senator Mark Warner, noting that renters are more likely to work in hard-hit industries like retail shops and hospitality. Help for renters in Sammy's building, where many tenants are African immigrants, comes from African communities together among other groups. People should not be paying rent when they're not working. We want some kind of housing justice where, you know, uh, rent has to be, co you know, commiserate with uh, people's income. Besides his unpaid rent, Sami has piled up credit card debt. Driving his Uber could help, but he fears bringing the coronavirus into his one-bedroom apartment. As he looks for a job, he tries to keep despair at bay. I'm hoping my job will come back sooner, but if it's not, that is one of the terrifying things that's going through my head every day and every night, because I don't know where to go. Veronica Valeras Iglesias for VOA News, Alexandria, Virginia.
The looming expiration of U.S. federal assistance tied to the coronavirus pandemic threatens to cut a financial lifeline for tens of millions of Americans. With time running out, Republicans and Democrats reportedly remain far apart on a possible extension of benefits. Viewers Maria Madiello has the story of a COVID survivor struggling to pay medical bills who desperately needs federal relief to continue. Medical bills are piling up for Aisha Brown, who survived the coronavirus. You got to call the people and let them know, like, you know, this is what's going on. I was sick. I, I'm, I'm sorry I can't pay this bill. The Maryland resident spent a month in the hospital where she endured a medically induced coma and three blood transfusions. This really got harder for us because it was like, how are we going to pay this? And where the money going to come from? The Salvation Army has helped Brown pay her electric bills. The group is among many urging lawmakers to quickly pass a new relief bill before the current one expires on Friday, leaving people like Brown without a major source of income during the pandemic. If my message to lawmakers can be one thing is, is um, really take a day and walk in the shoes of the families um, who have to make these critical decisions. The roughly $2 trillion Coronavirus Aid, Relief and Economic Security Act included payments of up to $1,200 for individuals with income under $99,000, plus $500 per child and an additional $600 federal payment a week added to unemployment benefits. With CARES Act payments set to expire on Monday, Senate Republicans announced a $1 trillion plan for a new aid package. I think this is a starting place. Uh, you can see that we've had a lot of our members <clears throat> involved in the start. And we can't pass a bill in the Senate without Democrats. That plan would trim weekly payments to $200, an amount Democrats say is insufficient. Democrats want more generous benefits to continue as part of a $3 trillion plan. People are being on the verge of eviction because they can't pay the rent. They've lost their jobs through no fault of their own. And again, uh, again, families can't pay the rent and they are resenting the fact that people were getting $600, which was helping to keep them out of poverty and make ends meet. With the two sides still at odds, the Trump administration says it's considering a short-term plan to prevent millions from losing aid if a deal isn't reached by Friday. As of now, we're very far apart because of that. Uh, the president and we have discussed a short-term extension to UI and uh, Meanwhile, Brown waits to see what happens in Washington. Having survived as a COVID patient, she now looks to survive the financial fallout of the pandemic. Maria Madiello, VOA News, Washington. The coronavirus pandemic is making its way into U.S. prisons nationwide. That's particularly true at San Quentin State Prison in California, where more than 50% of the 3,500 inmates have tested positive for COVID-19. But their efforts to release some prisoners early and enact other measures to try to keep inmates safe. Dina Mitchell has our report. Demonstrators chained themselves to the gate in front of California Governor Gavin Newsom's Sacramento home, calling for mass release of prison inmates statewide due to COVID-19 outbreaks in the state's prisons. For Chanda Williams, the fight is personal. She has been teaching yoga to inmates at San Quentin State Prison for the past six years. The prison has the worst coronavirus outbreak in the state's prison system, which houses more than 100,000 inmates. Williams has written letters urging authorities to release prisoners. These people were sentenced for crimes. They were not sentenced to die um, in prison, and certainly not by the negligence of the state. The state has a, um, it has a responsibility to maintain their health and their safety and their well-being, and the state has failed in that. The CDCR has failed in that. Like other institutions caught off guard by the virus, prisons in the U.S. have struggled with how to keep people, inmates and staff, safe. California is conducting widespread testing, and the governor has given early releases to about 3,500 inmates to ease overcrowding. But there have been setbacks. 
like in May, when it's believed prisoners transferred from the California Institution for Men in Chino to San Quentin brought the virus with them. In July, a top prison official addressed inmates in a video. We are making unprecedented changes to our operations, and we recognize the burden this has placed on those incarcerated in our prisons. At San Quentin, at least 19 inmates have died of coronavirus, including 10 on death row. Nationwide, more than 70,000 prisoners have tested positive, and at least 100 have died, according to the Federal Bureau of Prisons. One of Williams' students, 41-year-old Chan Thun Bun, tested positive July 1st, the day he was released. Bun was not given early release, but earned parole, he says, after serving 23 years of a 50-year sentence. He called the prison's handling of COVID-19 cases a chaotic experience. Because they had this thing where, where they like, you guys got to space out. And we told them, we can't space out in our cell. Our cell is, is five by, by nine, by 14. And then they came out with a memo, you guys got to sleep head to toe. And we're like, what does that do? The prison did not respond to a request for comment. In a video to the prison community, officials proposed steps to increase physical distancing, like moving inmates to alternative housing or other prisons, and changing schedules to allow for more sanitation. The inmates released so far were within 180 days of completing their sentences. The state is planning to release several thousand more, but says it must be done carefully. You don't want to just send people out and to park benches in homeless shelters. We've got to make sure uh, that we responsibly uh, move people out, but with a deep sense of urgency. Releases on a much bigger scale than what we're seeing need to happen if we're going to keep people safe. While officials say they are working to release more inmates as a way to limit those exposed to coronavirus, advocates continue to protest, saying it's not happening fast enough. For VOA News, Dina Mitchell, Oakland, California. We're excited to hear what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover during the discussion on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We're also streaming our broadcast live on Facebook. Please watch and share our show with your friends. Also check out our headlines 24 seven on voaafrica.com. Still to come, getting into the groove with the latest dance craze in Uganda. We'll be right back. your VOA health correspondent. I mean, let us be perfectly clear. All countries During the COVID-19 pandemic, the World Health Organization says there is no information or evidence suggesting that the coronavirus can be transmitted by mosquitoes. There are two published studies. It is a respiratory virus which spreads primarily through droplets generated when an infected person coughs or sneezes or through droplets of saliva or discharge from the nose. This happens during pandemics in the past. It's For more information on COVID-19, visit who.int or contact your local or national health authorities. On the next Straight Talk Africa, the Black Lives Matter movement in the United States has resonated with Africans and ignited protests to end police brutality. Join me, Vincent McCory, as I host a special edition of Straight Talk Africa and explore Black Lives Matter and Africa. Welcome back to Africa 54. Ivory Coast President Alassane Ouattara has selected Hamed Bakayoko to be Prime Minister, replacing Amadou Gon Koulibaly, who died suddenly earlier this month. 
Koulibaly was the preferred successor to Ouattara before his passing. Ouattara has yet to confirm if he will seek a third term, but he says he will make an announcement next week. Ouattara was nominated to be the presidential candidate of his RHDP party on Wednesday. Opposition groups in Ivory Coast are against Ouattara's attempt to extend his 10-year reign, saying a third term in office would be unconstitutional. The parties have until September 1st to declare their candidates for the election scheduled for October 31st. Some have seen in the COVID-19 the opportunity to reinvent themselves and provide original services. In Kinshasa, a young woman now offers a circulating library service, as she calls it, meaning she delivers books. Anastasia Tudiesh met her for us. Home delivery is a pretty well-developed service in Kinshasa, from goods to food. Since the beginning of July, a 23 years old woman has added books to the list of items the Congolese capital residents can get without stepping out. And it all started with confinement and a tweet. It's amazingly handy because the books come to us uh, at home, especially in this confinement moment. We don't get to go out uh, anymore, uh, let alone going to libraries or bookshops. This is the first time Dudu Kajangu has had rented books delivered to his house. And he is not the only one thrilled by the service. My daughter has loved reading since she was a little girl. And I encourage her to read a lot too. Because, you know, reading motivates. It actually boosts uh, the brain. It allows us to have a good vocabulary to write easily. Kajangu says renting the books and thus having to give them back is extra motivation to read, whereas buying books outright allows for procrastination. Kajangu is using a service developed by Soraya Odia called Majusco. Majusco is a room in library. The idea here is to bring books to people. Soraya says the idea of renting her books and delivering them to customers came to her while she was still working as an intern for the European Union. Having a lot of time on her hands, she decided to start a list of her books. When I finished listing my books, it made me think about the library I often go to. I told myself, they do that too. They even have a system. And why do I give people my books anyway? I could rent them and create an income. That's when the idea came about. I created a form to fill out for people who would subscribe and everything. That's when I tweeted it. Soraya hosts a weekly book show on her YouTube channel and builds her catalog with books donated and books bought from street sellers or Kinshasa's only second-hand bookstore. She's one of our most regular customers. She comes to buy books two or three times a month. Traditional shops, especially bookshops like Joe Kalongo's, have lost a good part of their clientele since the coronavirus confinement. That change has boosted Soraya's new online business and fueled her literary lifestyle. I consider myself a literary activist, if I may. I campaign for people to have access to books, because more than anything else in the DRC, literature suffers from the problem of distribution. And I think that when people say that Congolese people don't read, I don't find it to be totally true. Some want to read, but don't know where to find the books. So I see myself as a bridge between books and the Kinshasa residents in particular, and the Congolese in general. Majusco clients pay $10 plus transportation to have four books per month delivered to their homes. With a degree in rural economy, environment and project management, Soraya says she's still looking for a more traditional job. But while she's waiting, she's planning to move her Majusco operation to an office where she can expand her staff and her library. Anastasia Tudiesh for VOA News, Kinshasa. In our entertainment segment, watch the latest dance craze in Uganda by Shiba and Crystal Panda. And what better way to send you off to your weekend than a dance? Host of Music Time in Africa, Heather Maxwell and Kwame Ofori bring us the latest dance craze from Uganda. 
Today's song of the week is from Uganda. Now, the name of the song is Choina Omanya, and it's by Queen Shiva Karunji featuring Krito Panda. Yep, let's get right into it. Yeah, and let's dance. <laughs> You know, for I mean, the style of this song is just so much fun. You've got like, you've got kids dancing, you've got the couple kind of, you know, um, Cristo and Queen Sheba dancing together, and then you've got Crystal's crew. And everybody's just showing off their fun dance moves. It's just the greatest video to watch and and just sort of relax and not take life seriously. Oh yes, especially in these times. Yes. One thing I, I noticed though about the song is in the beginning it has a similar sound to Bob Marley's Would You Be Loved and that was quite interesting so kudos to the producer because that gave me a nostalgic feel and that made it even more fun. Hmm. I didn't realize that. <laughs> Something to know. <laughs> And speaking of something to know, Kwame, you know that the name of this song, Choina Omanya, means what you need to know in English. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I hope you like the song, everybody, and, uh, you know, try to keep it light even in these hard times. Oh, yes. And stay safe, stay home, and keep safe. That makes you want to get up and dance. Thanks, Heather and Kwame, for that exciting music segment. That's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voafrica.com from all of us here in Washington. Have a great weekend.